families? Are we presenting the truth of who God is? Uh, with our children, our grandchildren? Are we saving their lives? Are we ministering to people around us in Bible study and that sort of thing? Or are we simply uh, going to sit home and do nothing and really do harm by doing nothing? You see, Jesus didn't leave us with a, a middle place. And so as he's looking around, even as I'm looking around and, and you're looking at me, he's looking for some kind of a spark some kind of a realization on the part of these religious leaders that they get it. Oh, we need to do good. Apparently, he didn't see what he was looking for. He looks at the man. Stretch out your hand. And he did so. And in the process of putting that hand out, that hand, that arm, it was restored. They saw it. And they said, praise the Lord. No. They saw it. And the Greek word translated here, rage, says they went into madness. They went into madness. No logic, no reasoning, no understanding, no knowledge. They just went with a gut emotion of madness. All the work of God. And they went into madness. And their response was to discuss together what they might do to Jesus. Not for Him, but to Him. Our world today is changing rapidly from a world that acknowledged and understood and knew the importance of the things of God of spending time with God, of setting aside things. How do I know that's happening? That's kind of getting to be sort of a, a trivial thing to say. How many of you notice that we have two calendars now? We have two calendars. We have one calendar and it starts on what day of the week? Sunday. But then you go digging around and the next thing you know you find another calendar. And what day of the week does it start on? Monday. See, our world is getting, uh, it's establishing what the Apostle John refers to in 1 John as the spirit of Antichrist. That we're going to change, the Old Testament describes uh, the Antichrist as being a person who changes times. Changes times and structures. And so as we see our world changing and the things of God becoming less and less important, now you hear even on the weather. Uh, they're talking about what the weather's going to be like for the weekend. And they describe Sunday as a part of the weekend, folks. Sunday is the first day of the week. When God created the heavens and earth, and He completed it, and He rested, and it was Saturday. It was done. The work was done. That was the day of rest. When we went to Israel a, a few years back, I had the strangest experience. I, I wanted to share this with y'all. Uh, to know how important the Sabbath issue is in Israel to this day. And most of the Jews there are secularists. They don't really think a lot about God and, and theology and, and salvation and that sort of thing. But we were at the hotel. We walked into the hotel with our luggage. And people were looking aghast at us because we were carrying things. I'm thinking, why are those people looking at us like that, you know? Maybe we were going out or something. We were carrying things and they were just shocked. And so uh, we finished with everything and it was time to go to the room. And so you went over and the elevator's just standing up. So you walk in and you get ready to push a button and the elevator takes off. It goes up and it stops at every floor. The door is open and closed. Goes to the next floor. Opens and closes. That's some little kid has come in here and pushed every button. <laughs> it's programmed that way in Israel. Because if you have to push a button, you're working. So you get on it. It takes you up. It opens at every door. I don't know how they get in their room. You have to stick that little key thing in there. and Maybe they just leave their doors unlocked that day. I, I don't know what they were doing. It, 
you could you, people from the town didn't want to work on Sabbath. They came to the hotel, spent the night, and ate there so they didn't have to cook anything. And you would go into the restaurant and, and the, the people in the group, obviously, most of them Baptists, what were they looking for that morning? Over coffee, right? You'll have to go to the other part over there. Why? Well, because... We can't have cream over here because you're going to maybe eat beef and you can't mix beef and milk in the same area. We can't have that going on because of Old Testament law. So if you're going to drink coffee, then you've got to go over there. I mean, they're serious. You don't fly and on a, a Jewish airliner and have things that are not kosher. They're not going to serve them. They're not there. And we, as mostly Gentiles in our nation, we don't realize that Jesus is saying, look, Sabbath, as Lord of the Sabbath, that rest is a big deal. And I'm not talking about just the physical rest that comes as we talk about creation. But I'm talking about the idea of setting aside yourself, your time, your life, and your eternity with God. Notice in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, we have this instruction. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His promise. Now, this is in New Living Translation. I decided to use that today because uh, verse 23 really makes more sense as you go through the NLT. In New Living Translation, I'll get it out. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. We have a hope. The hope is in Jesus. It's not in Christianity. It's not in some religious view. Our hope is in Jesus. We hold tightly to Him without wavering. Hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep His promise. And as you and I live our lives as followers of Christ, and He is our hope, and He has promised to be with us and to never forsake us and to be our rest, and we have Him, then life can be more stable. Life can be more meaningful. Life doesn't have so much fear because we know Jesus is in control. Amen. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. That's the command. We're supposed to, as a church family, sit around and think about ways to motivate each other. And, and if you think about that, I'm going to try to motivate you, you're going to try to motivate me to be in Bible study. To be involved in ministry within the body, using the spiritual giftedness that God has given me, that God has given you. We're going to, we're going to encourage each other in, in uh, a mission to be outside of this place, sharing the gospel. And I'm going to try to motivate you to, and you're going to try to motivate me to. And we're going to motivate each other to fellowship. We're going to motivate each other to worship. Because these are the things, the works that Christian people have been given to do. And when we get to the end of all of those things and the work is completed, we will have His rest. We're going to talk about that rest more in a moment. Let us not miss how this motivation is going to happen or maybe where. At least one place for it. The place that Jesus has established for it. If we're going to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Why would it say let us not neglect our meeting together. Unless that was where that motivation was going to happen. In a primary way. You see for a lot of people. I don't need to go to church. Church is full of hypocrites. And I'm here so amen. Uh, we're not perfect. Any of you perfect yet have you? Nobody okay. I expected some of the youth to raise their hand. Uh, mom and dad don't know it, but yes. I'm perfect. And so, yes, you're going to come to the church. 
and we are people who are sinners who have been saved by God's grace. And now we have his righteousness. Now he has granted us his holiness. And yet we still are, are working with that old sin nature to allow the spirit of God to dominate and to control this part of our life. And so we come here for Bible study. We come here to worship. We come here for the preaching of the word. We come here to encourage each other and to motivate each other. And we're instructed as a command not neglect meeting together. Do not neglect. You say, well, why are you preaching us from here? Because you know people who aren't here. You say, well, that's just too confrontational to have to talk to them about this. Jesus says on the Sabbath, are you going to do good or are you going to do harm? Are you going to help people with life or are you going to lead people to death? And sometimes confrontation is the only way you can bring someone to life and help someone for good. How difficult is it, ladies, to have a baby? And yet you did it. It was painful, and yet you look forward to the outcome. The expectation that there was going to be a, a beautiful child, and it was going to be a glorious thing, but you had to go through the pain. And for many of us, we, we think of it as the opportunity to share the gospel is too confrontational. And yet what if that person eventually says yes to Jesus and there's new birth and new life and someone is born again because we shared and we cared enough to go to them and speak truth in love. Or go to a person who is a follower of Christ but has fallen by the wayside. And we say, well, it's too confrontational to go and talk to them about the fact that they're neglecting their meeting together, which was a command of the Lord. And that we care about them and we love them and we, we want them to be there so that they can motivate us and we can motivate them. And the Spirit of God can be at work in our lives. Encourage one another. Encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Now, if that passage is 2,000 years old, is the day of his returning closer now than it was when that passage was written? A couple thousand years closer? So should we be meeting more than they did or less? More. Pretty simple. Exodus 31. What? You're going way back, preacher. That's it. There we go. Here is the passage, which is a source for all of this. And as you look through it, God is speaking. You shall surely observe my Sabbath. For this is the sign between me and you throughout the generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Now, Sabbath participation for the Jew was a part of the law. It was connected to their salvation. Being in church, let me ask you a question. Will being in church save you? No, will not. Stand in McDonald's and it make you a hammer. Stand in the garage to make you a car. Stand in the church does it make you a Christian. These people, in their covenant relationship with the old covenant with God, had a very different view of Sabbath. You and I have now a different understanding of Sabbath. Notice as you go down through the passage, for six days work may be done. But on the seventh day, there's a Sabbath of complete rest. Holy to the Lord, whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. Boy, some of you ship workers are in trouble. Has it changed? Yes, it's changed. So... What are we recognizing on our Sabbath, if you please, on Sunday? Well, 
If you look at the passage here in Exodus, it's saying that it's a recognition of the completion of the work of God in creation. He created. He rested. What you celebrate and what I celebrate as Christians is the completion of the work of recreation. You see, when Christ rose from the dead and we could have salvation and we could be born again, we were going to have the opportunity to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. We now celebrate the recreation, the salvation work, that Jesus Christ completed on the cross and in his resurrection. If you'll notice in the last part of that passage from Exodus, so the sons of Israel observed the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. You, as a follower of Christ, will celebrate the recreative work of Christ. For all generations, it is a part of your new covenant. How do I know that? What do we call it when we put white cup covers, trays, little cups of juice, little pieces of bread, the Lord's Supper? How long are we going to continue to observe that? Till he comes. And then Jesus says that at the marriage feast of the Lamb, He's going to do something for the first time that he will have done since the upper room before his crucifixion. What was that? Do you remember? He's going to partake of the cup again. For the first time at the marriage feast of the Lamb, all the way back from the night before his crucifixion. That new covenant is the covenant of recreation. Recreation. 